it kind of sums it up, like what, what the heart of evangelization is, what we're really striving for, is having that heart that connects to Jesus. Um, so before I turn it over to our speaker, I wanted to just give a quick story. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And Pope Francis is one of my favorite role models in evangelization. And um, I'm going to show you a picture here on the PowerPoint, if you can. Uh, this is a picture of Pope Francis, and if you notice, he's embracing a man with a disease called neofibromatosis, and it causes, it's a genetic disease that causes tumors all over his body, and he, you can see it's, he doesn't even bat an eye, but he just embraces him. He sees Christ in this man. And um, I don't know if you know, but Pope Francis actually has a Twitter account, so this picture was tweeted. And someone responded, um, just tweeted back and said, I'm an atheist, but the more I know about Pope Francis, the more I like him. So even just that witness and that testimony um, of our Holy Father and his willingness to really um, go out and reach those who are, um, who are just in need of Christ's love. And that's really the heart of evangelization. So um, right now, we have some activities for the kids. So anyone who is in kindergarten through fifth grade um, are going to go with um, Mrs. Middlecamp and Mrs. Uh, and Mr. Taylor as well. And we said road, not street, because it was gravel. And, uh, 
really, to get there, you lived your course. So, um, my grandmother and my grandfather were like two of the most important people in my entire existence. I love, love, love them. When I was little, I loved them. I loved to pick the strawberries in my grandma's garden. When I was older, in like, I don't know, sixth grade, I loved to be there and, you know, like I asked them all sorts of questions. And where I really found the, the gold was in high school. And every Thursday night, I would drive from Cottonwood, where I would go to school, out into Wyoming, where I lived. And in that 30 minute drive, on minute 28, Grandma and Grandpa's house was on the right side of the road with the black mailbox. And every Thursday night, without fail, I would turn into the driveway and I'd have dinner with them before I'd go home. And so one night, I'm like 17 years old and thinking, oh, it's my first dance. I'm kind of like nervous because in my school, we weren't big enough to have like a freshman dance. You had to wait till you were junior. So it was like a big deal. I had just bought my dress. And I came in and my grandpa noticed something was going on. So he was like, so what's the matter? I said, nothing. I know what's the matter. I said, what's the matter? And I said, well, it's like my first dance you know, tomorrow night. And just kind of, you know, nervous. And he got this glint in his eye. It usually came after a second glass of wine and I had walked in about that moment. So um, you wait here. And then he had this limp. You know, so he would limp <laughs> into the back, very, very end of the, the house where his bedroom was. And he came back with a single sheet of paper. And my grandmother just looked at me like, and so he said, now I want you to see this. And I picked up a piece of paper, it's photo size, right? It was a photo. And it was a photo of 1956, and it was six different couples. And he says, your grandmother's the one in the red dress. <laughs> of course, this picture's in black. <laughs> <laughs> 1956. But I never forgot that moment, because you know what I realized? 1956, black and white, his memory was in color. And so when he handed me that picture, he was so excited. Everything in his face was glowing. I, I, don't, I almost felt like I was intruding on the moment, actually. I, even at 17, I kind of had the awareness that like, oh, this was kind of private. <laughs> but he and my grandmother exchanged a glance, and it was like, bang, back to 1956. Um, and the reason I wanted to start out with that is because memory is a powerful thing. It actually, in some ways, is stronger than death because it outlives time. So when you're talking about the Word of God, okay, you're talking about something that is actually a living memory of who this man was that fascinated thousands of people 2,000 years ago and who has gradually gained momentum since death. So when you're looking at the Word of God, what are we looking at? We're looking almost at a biography but it's something that's alive. If you've noticed this, if you ever share a memory with people, okay, you can share a memory if I'm in my community. I can share a memory about my grandfather. And everybody kind of gets it, and they're in it, and they really love it. But if I go home, and I share a memory about my grandfather with my dad, who was his best friend his entire life, there's, there's a feeling of alive in it. Yeah? When these apostles wrote the Gospels, okay, when John sat down on the island of Patmos and wrote the Gospel of John, it was a living memory. And when you're looking at how do I approach evangelization, right, there is a common theme that comes up. I would like to go ahead and address that in just a minute, not quite yet. Um, but I just wanted to say, before we start, I'm in love with Jesus Christ in every way possible. <laughs> So this is boring, I'm really sorry. I think it's fascinating. So I'm gonna talk about it like it's fascinating. And I invite all of you to give me that kind of Does this excite you? If this excites you, smile at me and say, yes, it does. Does this excite you? Yes, it does. Thank you, Catholics of America. Now, Michael, we are ready to go. <laughs> okay, before we begin, and before I give you the thesis statement of tonight's presentation, I would like you to, I would like a little audience participation. This statement, in order to evangelize, you have to know Jesus Christ. True or false? True. true. Any other answers? <laughs> I'm going to actually submit that that is the wrong answer. Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a pagan. This is actually a true statement, okay? The, the truth in this statement, in order to evangelize, you have to know Jesus Christ. You cannot evangelize without knowing Jesus Christ. It's like... It's like trying to be a Cincinnati Reds fan without knowing anything about baseball. Okay, so this is a very true statement, but what I would like to submit something. In the United States of America, we have a very strong danger, and I'm going to tell it to you right now. Strong danger is so I can evangelize.
size, I need to know Jesus. Or, the order. What I would say is a false part of this statement is that first part there, in order to. This is the very, this part here, I first discover the man. And then I evangelize. Get the difference? If you're just out there, because I think in the church, it's a big, it's a big uh, catch word right now, is evangelize, evangelize, go make missionary disciples. That's what we need to do. It's all true. It's all true. And actually, I spent my whole life doing it. It's such a privilege. It's such a grace. So my whole life is actually being able to have the gift of forming missionary disciples at high school girls. I have the perfect life that you can be done. important. For example, if you get married, how many of you are married in this room? Okay, so you've had this experience before, okay? Um, I bet you're really excited to have a family when you get married. But if you get married in order to have a family, we got serious issues going on. Back me up. Ladies of the house, back me up. You don't want to be married. No man to have a family. That's not how it works, right? But the fact that you love somebody and that life is an overflow, that would be the correct order. So, Anyway, just, just to play with your mind, that's the little statement I wanted to start off with, is when you're looking at evangelization, it's a result. But it's not a cause. Jesus Christ is the cause. <coughs> so that leads me to think, when I was given this topic, I was told, Jackie, talk about Jesus. That was literally my thing. It's because I know Nicholas Schmiel very well. We spent six years working in a consulate together, so you guys have a gift here in every way possible. I want you to know we hire her again in a second, but we don't pay money. So, you know, I just went. So, what the, what the thesis, if I had to put it in a nugget, okay, thesis statement of this presentation, this is what I would say, Michael Haley, can you give me a little, awesome, that'd be great. Um, the thesis statement, isn't that a beautiful picture of Jesus? He is the center. Michael, you can go ahead and hit one more. To present in this one evening, which will end on time, on my honor, I have my phone on alarm, okay? Um, to present a sketch of Jesus Christ, that's it. No theory, no, nothing on evangelization, just the man. If you want evangelization, come back next week, I heard it's gonna be good. <laughs> no, somebody else, it's okay, just kidding, somebody else. Um, to present a sketch of Jesus Christ in the next 40 minutes, in order, to provoke a desire to know him more, to love him more deeply, and serve him more passionately. Hashtag catechism of the Catholic Church. Anybody else? I, you might have some takers on this. I had a very traditional grade school education, and we had to memorize the catechism of the Catholic Church Q&A format. Who else here had to do that? Q&A catechism. I'm so glad to be part of this generation. Thank you. <laughs> that was good times. Okay, so um, in this base what we're gonna do tonight, is we're going to outline the biography of a man. We're going to go a little bit into the life experience of myself and Jesus, because the world needs witnesses, not teachers. And then um, in the end, I would like to offer you five practical ways, five practical take-homes on how to build my relationship with Jesus in my everyday life. If you think that's cool, go ahead and say cool. And that should be enough for us. But it wasn't. Mm -hmm. it wasn't. So the New Testament came and the heart of the gospel became God loved us enough to become a man. That's a whole other level of love. You know what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? <laughs> um, so when we're looking at this first part, I thought, what would be the easiest way? Like, for example, if I was giving this talk to high school kids, which is normally my audience, so sorry if it's a little under your level, not trying to insult you. Just happened. <laughs> um, I thought, how would I, what kind of image would I put on something like this? I would probably say, the gospel is like a biography written by somebody who was madly in love with the subject. So what I thought, since I am madly in love with the subject, capital S, and I'm writing a book, well, that's kind of an exaggeration, I've written a dedication page of a book, but I'm really hoping it's going to turn into a book by the end of the year, right? But I thought, <laughs> Like couch this whole presentation as a biography 
biography of Jesus Christ. Okay, not the divinity part. Okay, we don't want to um, be her heretics here. Uh, Jesus is divine. So we, we all know that. Okay. But what if we just took a look, almost like if you could put on a pair of like you know like those 3D glasses when you go to Disneyland and watch It's a Bug's Life. You know, and it's like you've seen It's a Bug's Life before, but all of a sudden you're starting to catch all these nuances that you never caught before. And then that bug gets you from the back of the seat. Not right? Um, can we just take a moment? Everybody take a big deep breath in. Bigger, bigger. Come on, people. It's been a stressful life. All right? Okay. And can you close your eyes as you breathe out? Close those eyes. Breathe a big deep breath out. I would like you to get in your fourth grade mind right now. And put on a pair of 3D glasses. And we're going to take a second look at the gospel. You can open your eyes. Michael Haley. That would be awesome. Who? is Jesus Christ. You have one job in the next half an hour. One. And that is, either you're allowed to do this on your cell phone, take a note, write it down on a piece of paper, make a mental note. One thing in the next 30 minutes that you've never thought about when you thought about Jesus. One, one new nuance that if you're sitting down, reading the biography of Abraham Lincoln, and you realize, oh, I never knew he liked fried potatoes. I don't know if that's actually Abraham Lincoln, that's just the Idaho girl and me. But uh, one thing that you've never thought about with Jesus so far, and we're going to take his life biography style. So, I looked up online as a child of my own generation millennial. Yes, I did this. I googled elements of a biography. And I found a very helpful list of, I think it's seven, yep, of seven different elements that go into every biography. So I thought, well, let's not recreate the wheel. I, I don't need to create a unique biography. My subject will take care of it. I just need a format. So that's the format we're going to follow. And the first thing in this biography that they told me I need to have in order to really like explore a person is cultural background. So go ahead, Michael Haley. Cultural background. So if you see this here, this is Palestine, okay, in the year 2000, not in the year zero, but trying to find an attractive picture of Palestine from the ancient time. <laughs> they call this ancient pottery. I saw like half an hour. Right? Okay. Um, what do we know about Jesus Christ based on where he's from, his birthplace, and his culture? If I may. You see in Jesus Christ all over the place a very strong sense of where he's from. Now that really appealed to me when I was doing this and actually I kind of re-fell in love with him like three days ago when I was looking this up online because this was the part I had to research yet. And when I was looking up like the cultural values that are in Palestine right now and when I compared it to this man that I love, I saw a lot of similarities. Because when you look at this, some similar things um, of the culture of Palestine and Jesus, there's just a very strong sense of I am God's name. I am part of my culture. The cowboy's daughter in me went crazy over that. Because really, I watch a John Wayne movie and I cry. You know? But there's something strong. You big Westerners who have maybe lived here, moved somewhere else, and come back. You get it. You know how there's like a sense of like home somewhere and you just know it's you? This shows up all over in the man. He is Palestinian. Through and through, and actually, very interestingly, he's from the tribe of David, which means not only is he part of his culture, the blood of Judah runs in his veins. If you don't know anything about the Old Testament, I suggest looking up Judah, he's a fantastic character. He is the line of kings. So from the very beginning of the, the Jesus' life, there's this, like, he's like a blue blood, dressed blue collar. Do you know what I'm saying? He's majesty, but he also has this sense of like, everybody's man, because nobody knows his majesty, but actually if you look at his lineage, he's the next one in line after 700 years of no kings. He's gonna be the king. Also, in Jesus' cultural heritage, similar to some of you who maybe have moved out of Cincinnati and seen a different side of the world, right, and then come back, he was a refugee in Egypt for like four years. So during very influential times in his life, Jesus experienced suffering. And if you watch, that suffering marks him as a man. Because when he gets into, into like all his healings, he physically cannot walk by suffering. But you know what? You know how you, how, you know how you know somebody suffered? Watch how they react to somebody else suffering. I'll never forget, I lived, um, when I was at the University of Idaho, I had a college roommate who was different than me in every way possible. She was atheist and, had, and was a vegetarian. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, I was Catholic discerning my vocation. I was okay with the atheist part, so we could work with that. But I was like, vegetarian? I 
day of that. <laughs> so uh, I, I didn't actually have any clue how much she suffered in her life. Both of her parents were actually addicted to methamphetamines growing up. So you can imagine that life. And then one night when we were at a party, um, there was things going on at a college party that many of you know about, right? Um, and there was one girl who was just totally broken in this you know, little tiny grunge room of an apartment. And everybody else ignored her, and Sally Ames, my roommate, sat down next to her. And at that moment, I knew that girl suffered. And if you watch Jesus, he's the same way. He physically can't walk by somebody who's suffering, probably from being so marked in those early ages of what it looks like to be the only Palestinians in Egypt during a time where that would have been real discrimination. So anyway, side note, blue blood dressed as blue collar. That would be our Jesus. Um, and we're going to move on to family members in the next part of this little biography. So family members, oh sorry Michael, I forgot that you don't know my speech. <laughs> I'll be better about that. Um, so family members, if we're looking at a family tree, next slide, if we're looking at a family tree, we actually only know three legs of Jesus' family tree. We know that Jochum and Anne were his grandparents on the maternal side, and that Joseph's father was Jacob, but we don't know who Joseph's mother was. Maybe she died in, you know, childbirth? We have no idea. We know, know nothing about Jesus' paternal grandmother. Um, but what we do know is his home life, next slide, his home life must have been something really interesting growing up. And here's the deal. I'm not trying to be a heretic here, but I don't have a lot to work on, because if you've ever read the Gospel, we have three little tiny lines on Jesus' hidden life. And it is, he grew in wisdom, age, and stature before God and men. So I thought to myself, because this, this part of the biography that I had to fill out, I had no idea how to do this, because I don't want to be like somebody who's like trying to do coke, right? Because I'm not. I'm happy to do coke friends. It's like, what? Um, but I thought, okay, what if we took a lens on who, okay, this is Jesus' childhood. What if we took a lens on who the man was when he finally grew up, and what that reflected about his childhood? And I like that. I like that a lot. So this is what I think. When Jesus was this age right here, tender, tender, his home life. Okay, what, what, so I just put three experiences together that knowing him and also knowing what the gospel says about him, I figured would have to be true. He would have to have had a very deep experience of a woman. Because really, I mean, what are the chances that some man in Palestine were not even allowed to talk to women? outside of your family, okay? That he can sit down in John chapter 4 next to the Samaritan woman and catch all the nuances of that complicated conversation. I mean, I try to read that sometimes. If you ever feel like you have a lot of drama in your life, John chapter 4, that's your chapter, baby. I work with teenage girls, that's like do or die. Okay? Because this woman is coming to the well and she's got everything in the whole world going on, but she doesn't need to say anything to Jesus because she really wants to talk to him, so she puts up the wall. But that is kind of how it works. And Jesus navigates that so well. So in his early years, he must have had a very, very strong experience of what it meant to be in love with a woman. I'm going to go ahead and say that that's Mary, okay? I also thought, I think he probably must have had a very healthy experience of relationships growing up. I don't know if you guys are on this track at all, but in my business we do a lot on like attachment theory and we have a lot of uh, psychology we have to study in our background. So, I mean, it's good. I, mean, I use it, but it's probably not the gospel, right? Which is another story in itself. But what I found very helpful is the whole idea of what he must have seen in his parents growing up is probably, uh, my grandmother used to say this. She used to say, you want to see how loved a kid will feel? Watch how much those two people love each other. And that's how much I feel. And you know, I remember, I remember being in seventh grade, and my Aunt Carla, who was like the goddess of my existence, she was like 21 and so cool. She let me dye my hair when I was 14 years old going over to her house. So cool! Um, but she, I remember, I'll never forget this, it's Christmas one year, and all of my mom's family, all eight of the kids and all of their, you know, ten kids each, were over at my grandmother's house. And I didn't catch this moment, because it was normal for me. But my dad came behind my mom when she was doing the dishes and just hugged her. Which wasn't that common for my dad because he was a cowboy and was affectionate. But he went to my mom and he hugged her from behind. And my aunt Carla looked at me and said, "You're so in love." And I remember as a kid, like, like I physically felt this. I like straightened up and I felt like in my 14 year old self, like so proud. And yes, they're in love. Those are my family. Yep. And I think Jesus 
must have had a similar experience, but think about really the reality of what he must have seen and why that must have been so important for the relationships he was able to build later. You're talking about a man and a woman who love each other, but that are chased for their entire marriage. So imagine the depth of friendship and respect and honor that must be there to be able to do that for 30 years. Imagine how much you'd really have to work to know somebody. Um, and then I also thought this was just kind of a side note, something I've been thinking about lately, so it's either here or there. Sorry, I'm going to go to the next slide. He must have had great boundaries. You can keep going, sorry. Um, he must have had great boundaries because if you see, like, my favorite, one of my favorite things in the gospel, if, you, if you've ever lived in a house with strong personalities, you just, God just loves us about Jesus. There's one day when Jesus is walking down the road, and he wants to go to this town. And the people say, um, no, Jesus, we do not want you here. Go on to the next village. And Jesus is ready to go. He's pulling out. He's got the car and drive, you know? And John and James come to him and go, you want us to call fire down on that village? Do it right now. Now, you say the word, Lord, we'll call brimstone down from fire, and this town will be compact. And Jesus says, no boys, it's not going to work. We're going to keep moving. But that one simple line for Jesus that he must have experienced as a kid, as a normal kid, sometimes having to have like a little bit of boundary. Not because he was sinful, thank the Lord, because he was perfect, but that he was energetic, probably. And I'm sure there were moments where Mary had to lay down the line. So that's why I think there were three lessons that could have been uh, in Jesus' childhood. And then this next one, sorry, can you go back one slide? Add uh, one more up. Uh, The early years of life. Okay, so that's his family life, the general environment he could have, you know, grown up in. But for this next section, we have two, three different phases of his life: the early life, the adolescent life, and the young adult life. And then he dies. Thirty-three. Well, think about that. Think about how many of you have lived past thirty-three, and think of how much we still have to go to be like do this, right? Um. So what I wanted to do is for this. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. His name is Eric Erickson. He is a psychosocial development expert. He's a fantastic psychologist in many ways. There's a few things I disagree with, but what he has is really fascinating insights in how to how a human person develops. So what I thought, um, okay, why not take the, the stages of development by Eric Erickson and see what we can find about Jesus in the gospel about his early years, adolescent years, and his young adult years. We will go ahead and start at the infancy of Jesus. Eric Erickson says that there's a couple things that you gotta know when you're like, you know, in infancy. Evidently he knows because he remembers, but nobody really questions him, he's a psychologist. And I think he's probably right. I haven't heard anything different, right? Um, he says probably the things that you wanna do when you're like zero to three is learn how to trust people, because otherwise you'll starve to death, right? Um, and also learn how to be independent. So again, we have zero to go on, except for Bethlehem, right? Yeah, I actually think that, you know, Bethlehem probably had its ups and downs. <laughs> um, what do we see in the man Jesus, you know, 30 years later, that can give us a hint as to, was he somebody who experienced a lot of trust? Was he somebody who experienced a little independence? I would submit, yes, he was. So we can start with trust. One of my favorite, well, I should have ever gotten to the passage, I promised I wasn't going to trust one moment where I am in love with Jesus Christ. In love, in love, it's actually on the inside of my ring. And it is um, when he's in front of Pilate. And Pilate comes to him and says, I have the power to crucify you. And Jesus stands on his own two feet. Maybe it's the resilient farmer in me that just loves this, you know? He stands on his own feet in front of Pilate and he looks Pilate straight in the eyes. And to the man who seemingly has the power to kill him, he says, in response to Pilate's question, you, are you a king? Jesus says right back at him, you say I'm a king. You are the one that says I'm a king. The reason I put that down for trust is because actually I think that that's what motivated Jesus in, in his encounter with Pilate. I think he actually trusted Pilate to hear the truth. And you know what Pilate did hear the truth? Because he actually tried to stop and then he was too weak. But Jesus was right. Pilate could hear him. Yep. And I think, what a strong foundation of trust it must have been in those early years of Bethlehem. I love this picture. I love this. This is why Mary's smiling and Joseph is not. If you've ever been in the hospital room when they bring out the baby, I have this experience. I think that the love that these two people put into this child, he was a real kid. And what that must have 
looked like in those first three years. How beautiful. What a cool thing to walk into, right? That's the early years. Think about being a toddler, though. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's go past the glory days, right? Let's go into the terrible twos and the nose. Yep, go ahead, Michael. Love this picture. Isn't that cute? It's with Joseph, the little baby Jesus, who is just trying to figure out his arm, I guess. Because it's a new thing, you know, when you're teaching yourself everything in the world. Um, Eric Erickson would say you gotta probably have independence at this stage. We did need to feel like you can go out and explore. And um, I would say actually that probably happened when he was his age. I'm guessing that Joseph probably let him have this space. You know, play around the toolbox and then Mary probably let him scrape his knee a couple times and just, you know, do those crazy things that boys do. Try to eat the vacuum cleaner and you know, I mean just random things, right? Because when you look further in his life, what you see is Jesus tears apart the temple. And people come to him and they ask him, by whose authority do you do these things? And on a human level, okay, there's a real cool part of this that he's divine in that moment, so really he's got all the authority he wants in the whole world and he knows it. But as a human person, he's at the point where he realizes, no, no, this is, this is my temple. I stand on my feet. This is who I am. We Americans, we love that. I live in a multicultural community. And like, you say that at dinner, people are like, hmm, from Austria, she's like, oh. Yeah. And the rest of us Americans are like, yeah! <laughs> God, the underdog wins, stand on your feet, independent. So I'm thinking that toddlerhood was probably pretty good for Jesus. Next slide, Michael. Um, with that, um, there's probably a sense in Jesus that he's capable. Why? Because you know what? He did everything wrong to do what he was supposed to be doing. If you, if you think about in the public life, when Jesus starts building the kingdom, okay? What's the first thing you should do? Get an army, and it's the first thing you should do. Everybody knows that. You want to take something by force, you get an army. But he has his own thoughts. He stands on his own feet. And what you see here is, Erickson calls this industry versus inferiority. Um, I think a layman's terms is, can I do things? And what this kid must have experienced, I love, I love this right here. This was for the last slide, actually. This is Jesus crawling out of the tabernacle. How cute is that? Right. But the next slide. Um, one more. Sorry, Michael. Oh. I think what he must have experienced is when he first started going out of the public life, okay, um, he knew what he was doing, and the people asked, is not this the carpenter's son? I think that's really cool for two reasons. Number one, his strategy by any means did not make sense to anybody else. And I think in some ways the whole idea of building the kingdom on humility probably still doesn't make sense, right? But he knew. And you know, we're you know, three billion strong later, right? But in this moment also when he goes out, there's something of the sense that he's known to be the carpenter's son. I, maybe it's the blue collar in me, or maybe it's working in Cincinnati enough to know hard work is a value here, right? But the fact that he was known as a carpenter's son, that means that he did what he did well. If you were known as the carpenter's son, at least the carpenter has something to say, right? Um, so with that, and what I see later, he's a very capable man. When he's out preaching on the hill, I love this, when he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he looks out at the crowds, what's the first thing he does? He organizes people in the 50s and 100s. Because he's capable, he's a good administrator. It's stuff that he learned in the carpenter shop of how to, you know, be capable. So, lastly, what we have, at least for development, right? It is wonder years is the adolescent years. So you can go ahead to Michael, one, two, awesome. We see here two things. An anomaly, we see a teenager that's willing to really listen. That's awesome, that's really cool. And then we also see, in the next slide, we see, um, as an adolescent, what he must have experienced. And this is actually something I know for sure, know for sure. If you ever work with adolescents, the number one like rule of the game is identity, right? Um, if you ask a kid, who are you? They have no idea what to say. But if you say, what do you do? They say, ah, oh, I'm a soccer player. They don't, they don't say, I do soccer, it's I'm a soccer player. Okay? If you ask them, um, you know, what, what player are you doing right now? Oh yeah, I'm one of those people. I'm, I'm a drama, I'm a drama person, I'm a nerd. They'll think of themselves automatically, right? Do you know what comes out of the adolescence of Jesus Christ? I am the light of the world. Tell me, that's not a healthy childhood. Imagine your teenage girl right now being able to say that. Can you imagine saying that? Right? I mean, it's like, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. On a very human level, we see that Jesus Christ must have had a really interesting journey in adolescence and actually a very healthy one during good. Okay, 
Next slide, Michael So with that, we see a man who's entering into young adulthood, right, for writing his biography. What does every young adult want in the whole world? Raise your hand if you're working college kids. I'm working with a couple college kids right now who are adorable, adorable. Seniors at a parish around here, just graduated, went to Miami, and spent out to coffee with several of them. What does every young adult want when they're in college and cannot get community? I want community, I want friends. It's like written all over every desire of their entire existence. One girl told me, I love this. She's like, I just need, it's okay, I just need a group of people where I can like fuzzy blanket with. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I just need to be able to watch a movie and cry and like not be judged. I'm like, okay, so don't judge her right now. Don't judge her, she's crying in Starbucks, but it gave me a very interesting insight, right? Uh, oh, of course, I was there myself first, so you remember that, but um, for some of the um, young adult, what do you want? Erickson says you want to like figure out can you be have close relationships or not? Yeah. I love this about him. I love, love, love this about him. He is the relationship master. Master. He knows every way to get to any person. If anybody's ever experienced complication in a relationship, oh, say yes. You don't have to raise your hand because I would hate to embarrass you, but you would not be the only one raising your hand. Um, what it meant that he could actually come to us and say that he himself knew human nature well and at the end of John chapter 5. I love that. Uh, where do you see like proofs that Jesus understands how to have relationships with other human people? I would say in his band of brothers moments. Have you ever seen the movie We Are We Were Soldiers? If you haven't seen that movie and over the age of 18, please watch that movie. It's a fantastic movie. And Michael Haley's not just that. I'm sure you love that movie, actually. Um, basically, if I have to boil it down into an experience in a nutshell, this movie, which is awesome, it's like this experience of, you know, this band of brothers, these men. And they're like manly man because they are like dodging bullets and like lifting cars with their bare hands. You know, those guys, right? But the, the bond of friendship between them because their lives are on the line is so strong that you almost feel it through the screen. That's this moment. You know, when you're looking at the Last Supper, Jesus and his band of brothers, that's that moment. If he, um, think of what they did. I love, I love thinking about when Jesus and that woman reached out, it's the hemorrhaging woman, she reached out to touch his garment. Yeah. What do you think the apostles were doing at that point? Earlier on in the book verse, it says that they were the crowds were pressing upon Jesus so much that he didn't even have time to eat. Okay? That actually there's one part where the apostles have to keep the crowds from suffocating Jesus. Imagine how cool that would be. I come from a place where we don't have fire trucks. I'm not joking. We do not have fire. You're right. That was looking surprising. That's exactly what I was hoping for. No fire trucks because do you know what we have? We have a bunch of old farmers who want to put out the fire, and if the Forest Service wants to come, we're going to send them right back home. Every farmer has their own water truck. And when there's a fire, there's a huge, there was a huge forest fire in my hometown, or in, back in my ranch, probably like three months ago. Lightning hit in three different places. It was so hot, it was melting, siding off buildings from 20 feet away, okay? So, um, what happened? 80 different men <laughs> showed up at my mom's door and said, we got this. And it was fascinating to listen to how these guys work. It was really interesting. See, you men, like, you men have a genius for this, actually. I, I'm, I'm convinced men have a genius for friendship. You can have it without really having real, like, deep communication. You just kind of know. I don't know how you guys do it. Actually, it's a mystery. But I think when you're looking at Jesus, that you guys are all laughing because you probably know that's right, right? But, like, when you think of the apostles, what an adrenaline rush where they have to get out there and they have to, like, you know, make sure that these people don't like, you know, uh, suffocate Jesus. And I think sometimes it got to their head because when the little children came, they're like, oh no. And Jesus says, it's okay boys, that they can come through all kinds, you know? But to have something that was like their mission together, that's the genius of Jesus in relationship with men. And with relationship with women, I think he also has a fair amount of genius because you watch the conversations he has, um, the finesse, the delicacy, the intuitiveness of the woman who's, you know, in front of them, the adulterous woman, and he says, he starts drawing in the ground. I love that. Why do you think he did that? <coughs> Nobody knows what it said. Evidently, what he said in the ground wasn't important, but it was important for him that the eye contact came off her for a moment. Because he could read it. And he's genius. <laughs> totally genius. Um, so what I think here is, you're dealing with a man in his young adulthood, 
30, 33, where he has a richness in his person and he's able to express it. That's pretty crazy. So with that, um, I think we have, um, finally, his ability. You know, like that moment comes when, you know, if you settle down and get married, you know, Jesus, you know, did, you know, settle down and get married in the Bible, right? But you can see the life-giving part of him. You know, like most men discover this in their fatherhood when they have that child in their hand, right? But when you watch this man and you see the life that radiates from him, radiates, yeah? It's like this, this purity that just comes out in life, right? And so you see him like laying his hands on the people, bringing the children to him. That's pretty beautiful. So that's basically the journey of Jesus um, through his biography. There was an appendix. So I'm going to give you an appendix. Go ahead, Michael, if you could give me the appendix, that would be great. We have here just a few elements in the appendix that don't take up near as much time. Um, but what I see here is Jesus had in his fatherhood, that we were talking about briefly, the experience of unlocking life in a person. So when you watch him in his career, which we can talk about in a minute, I think it's on the next slide, Michael. Uh, sorry, I think it might have gotten confused a little bit on my computer. Can you go two down, Michael? One, two, three. Yeah. Can we just give Michael a round of applause? Because he's been working so hard. The career space was gone, that was the, that was one of the appendix, but we can just make it up, right? Uh, make up a picture. But basically, what we have here, what's different about Jesus in his career? That was one of the elements, that last element of the biography. And I would say, okay, if you're just a human person looking at the career of Jesus, fascinating combo. Motivational speaking, okay? Um, and this uh, kind of sense of counseling, a little bit, you get a lot of those conversations that you're not expecting, and a very unique form of holistic healing. You know, like that was pretty cool, like a medical doctor only, no more need for a doctor, it was just like one touch and bang, you're done. Um, but if you look at um, what was so beautiful about this man, is that there was a strain of eternity in him that unlocked something in man that nobody had ever done and nobody could do after that. And that was the secret of what he was doing for us then. Yeah. When you're looking at this man from a human point of view, right? Fascinating little biography. When you're looking at it from a divine point of view, the fact that this man is walking on earth and that he is putting life into my soul just by breathing on my soul, you know? He's doing something that nobody ever had done, and that was put eternity in me. So my fault, can you go like just keep going until I tell you, because I don't know what's going on in that whole slide. Nope, keep going, keep going. Nope, keep going. Fast, okay, back to you, that'd be great. So, um, after the career space in the biography, the last thing that they told me to do, two things, was the cause of death <laughs> and photographs. So, I would like to present to you cause of death. Cause of death would be, okay, that is true. I would also say cause of death was very calculated love. Because if you read actually how popular Jesus was in the New Testament when he was crucified, do you know he actually had to arrange for his own crucifixion? When he came into Jerusalem um, with the palm branches and stuff, do you know what the chief priests who were the ones that crucified him, do you know what they said? They said this to the, chief, the temple guards. They wanted the temple guards to go get him, and then the chief priests looked at each other and they said, quote, you see, you can do nothing. The whole world has gone after him. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem to die. Like, that's, that's his point. To die. He's been try they tried to assassinate him three different times in the Gospel before this, and he walks away in the midst of them because he's like Bruce Willis. He's just the boss. You know what I'm saying? Um, when he gets to Jerusalem, he deliberately goes to Jerusalem to die, and he can't. He can't get killed. He's too popular. Like, they're like, don't arrest him during the Passover. We're like, well, we don't know what else to do. Nobody else, nobody's ever spoken like this man. Everybody is trying to get to Jesus. Jesus has to provoke his own death in order to die. <laughs> he actually has to um, scandalize Judas, which he does, by you know not being the king that Judas wants him to be. He has to let Judas go. Think of how easy it would have been with 11 other fully grown men in that room when Jesus looks at Judas and says, do what you've come to do. Of course, those 11 men are his, we were 
soldiers to watch. I mean, that Judas would have been pinned to the ground in 60 seconds if they would have had a little more intuition and noticed what was going on, right? But Judas could have done that. So the fact that this is the cause of death, love, like, calculated love, because he needed to put eternity in my soul, he needed to do that. Um, and then, the last part of the biography, the appendix, was photographs. And when I thought, what photographs would I put up? I could only think of one. And it's the only one we really have to worry about. Because when you're looking for the image of Jesus Christ, that's the living memory. The biography is real. Jesus is really alive. I chose this because I had a very strong moment, several in front of the universe in my life, right? Um, but this was probably four years ago. I was on my eight-day retreat. Um, if you're consecrated, you get an eight-day retreat every single year in science. Very cool. Um, so I'm on this retreat, and I had this moment where I was um, like meditating on the Last Supper. And I saw um, Jesus raise the host at the Last Supper. And I can describe it to you in such detail. It was so beautiful. So beautiful. I mean, the light's low, the, the fire and the smoke coming out of the oven from the bread, right? And him taking in his weathered, tanned hands, you know? Farmer's hands for me. And just touching that bread and holding it this far away from it and holding it right in front of me and just looking at it. And there was an experience inside of me of knowing in this house is every memory of my entire life. And this too. Because I thought about what it, what was it that actually, like if I had to think, what um, what encapsulates, why am I doing this? You know, like you have those moments, I don't know if your moms have this moment, but I have this moment sometimes where I actually don't feel like being consecrated to God. <laughs> you wish you did, <laughs> but it just not, you know what, tonight would be a great night to go out to the movies and not be accountable to anything. You know, tonight would be a great night to have money to buy a hamburger, I mean, I remember this happening especially when um, I was first consecrated because I was 20 years old. So I, for those of you who don't know what consecrated is, it's um, a lifestyle that takes the vows, but really like. So I take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Um, so I told the girls, Jesus is my husband. The girls like, nice ring. I think you should see the man that comes with it. <laughs> um, but the, I remember on my 21st birthday, laying in bed, <laughs> thinking, why am I here? Because I was in the formation center of the consecrated women of Regina Christie. Moments throughout my life, right? Where you, and you have this experience too, right? Like these little crisis moments where you're like, I used to be cool. I'm like I used to. My brother's like, I used to have the Chevy. The Chevy wasn't even that cool of a car. It was better than the minivan. <laughs> like these moments where you just have identity crisis a little bit, not bad because you love your life, but um, and so you just kind of wonder, like, why am I doing this? And all the time it comes back to these moments, you know, uh, that first moment when you're kneeling in front of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament at the University of Iowa. And um, I remember so clearly, so, so, so clearly, um, in the middle of my sorority, knowing he's calling me to be a consecrated woman of Raymond Christie. I didn't even know what that was at the time. I just knew that that meant to marry Jesus, and that was definitely the route he was going. Um, and I remember thinking, I, I can't. I can't leave my family, and I, I don't even have dreams. I just want to, I don't even want to, I don't want to leave my home. I mean, to leave my home was the biggest thing. Um, and I remember kneeling in front of him that night, and I, and I remember thinking what I wanted to say was, don't make me do it. I mean it. You know? I love you and you know I love you, but don't make me do it. But what I said, because I couldn't tell him that, I said, I have always loved you with my life. And it's not even my fault. <laughs> like, you won me already, so what am I supposed to do with this? And his response to me, and I'll never forget this, um, in the Blessed Sacrament, I will wait for you as long as you want. There's no hurry here. It's all right. We can stay here. Like, you can love me in college as well as you can love me in the formation center. That's when I decided to come. I'm like, one man that treats me like that deserves my whole life, you know? Um, or, or for other moments where it's, um, it's like when you fall in love and you don't even realize it's happening. And then you're in front of them. And you realize, without even quite knowing how, like every fiber of my being is caught up in that host. Almost like it's woven. I don't even know who's doing the weaving. The reason I say this is because there is something so, so, so powerful in the person of Jesus Christ. Powerful enough to actually make me happy in this life. That's what I can't believe. I can't believe that. I can't believe the girl. I always tell the girls they're so cute. They have all sorts of questions, right? Um, but, so like, you're never going to get married. 
And actually from them, I never feel insulted. I really don't, because they don't know yet. You know? It's when adults ask me that, that actually I didn't used to feel insulted, but then the more I go on, the more it's just like, it's a realization of either I am a stark, mad, crazy person, which, I mean, is a possibility. <laughs> either I'm a stark, mad, crazy person, or Christ Jesus is alive and real. So when people ask that question, my immediate response is, what are you talking about? And then you remember what it was like before you knew that, before you knew what it was like to have that relationship. Right? But the, the power of Christ Jesus in the Eucharist, this is the memory of in color. This is the red, this is my grandmother wearing her red dress, right? In the black and white photograph. So with that, 755, I told you. Okay. I just like, I hardly ever really end on time, but this is the day. So the last thing that we have, ladies and gentlemen, I promised you five practical ways. Yep to bring us home. These are ideas. If you are anything like an American perfectionist, you might look at this and say you have to do all these tomorrow. That's not the truth. This is a smorgasbord, ladies and gentlemen. Do, 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 do. You can choose any of these that so fit your fancy. I'm just going to read them aloud to you so you know, OK? Um, things that you can do here, OK? Number one, read five lines of the gospel every single night. That's one thing I want to think you need to do every day to make this work, OK? This has happened to me with high school girls all the time. I didn't actually used to think that this was so powerful until Jesus started working without me. I always thought it was kind of important. And then I started telling girls to do this and I realized I'm not important. <laughs> what they really need is God. I bet this year, three different girls have come to me from just this semester, right? Uh, saying, all of a sudden they feel like Jesus is talking to them. Because like, they'll read something in the gospel and it won't even matter. And then like, at lunch, their friends are talking about something that has nothing to do with God and it's just like Jesus pops up. Don't know why this works, but I know it does. So I have you like that. There's also talk to him in the passenger seat on your commute. My mom taught me this. Uh, she always said Jesus was her best friend, and I never believed her until I started seeing that the things that she did work. Um, but she actually would, um, <laughs> she'd pull the, the seatbelt down from the car and buckle it in, in the passenger seat, physically. I'm not talking like Jesus take the wheel, I'm talking like real car ride. And talk to Jesus in her car rides, in her commute. Um, like a friend. Make a holy hour and alarm it. I've done this with some of the girls before. It's like, um, I hated geometry, hated it with a passion. I also had a really good woman in my high school that told me how to turn geometry into a time of prayer. I didn't care about prayer then, but I was willing to take anything I could get. <laughs> so I set an alarm on my cell phone for 10.20. I still remember in the morning for my ge geometry class. And from 10.20 to 11.20, everything in that hour was for Jesus. But it kind of reminded me that Jesus cares about my life. So if that's helpful for you, I call that alarm on my phone, Jesus. You can call whatever you want. Um, there's also a fourth possibility. This is actually advice from Teresa of Avila. Find a picture of Jesus that you really, really like. Very simple. I have it on the wallpaper on my phone. Um, other people have it in their wallet. Very cool. Lots of options there. And then the last one, options. Find five ways Jesus was trying to catch your attention today. The first like two weeks of this is excruciatingly painful. <laughs> a lot of times it's hard to find it. But if the only thing you can do is iced tea, because you had iced tea for lunch, has happened to me. I did 30 days at the silent retreat in Rome, Italy. I have a great life, I really do. So um, believe it or not, I was praying all day, every day, and the first thing I put on this list every single day was peach iced tea. Because truth be told, all the meditations were in Spanish. I was just learning the language. Really wasn't getting much, but that iced tea in the middle of the day was like spot on, and that was Jesus trying to love me. So these are some ways that you can take something like this home in case you want to do practical, because sometimes we can go theoretical, but never practical. And then lastly, what I would like to do, and then it is straight up in front, um, throw this out there. I would like you to think right now, we're going to take a little moment of quiet, we're going to end with a prayer, and before we start, I would just like you to think of what's one of the things that you learned about Christ Jesus today in this talk. And let's just grab that, let's put that like on a little file folder in my head. Okay? One new thing I learned about Jesus tonight. Just anything you remember, doesn't have to be life changing, just any old thing. And I'm going to ask you one simple question. What is going on in my life right now? That's a question that's worth pondering because usually he connects them. So if there's an aspect of Jesus' character that caught me tonight, or a part of his history, or a part of his personality that stuck out to me tonight. What was that? Try to put a name on it. Loyalty, independence, dedication, whatever. And what's going on in my life right now? Because I had a very good friend tell me once. I 
think that the things that we are most attracted to in Jesus Christ are actually the way that he wants to come to the world through us. So I'll leave that with you as a little possibility for maybe a call this evening of what was attracting me about the person of Jesus and how do I bring that to the world? That would be natural evangelization, which I'm sure you'll learn more about next week. But in the meantime, let's end in a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this night, this moment. We thank you, Lord, for the goodness of all of these people that have worked so hard to put this night together. And we ask you, Lord, to come with fire on our world and in our hearts. We ask that you give us the grace to know you better, to follow you more closely and love you more deeply. And Mary, we place this night in your hands as we pray, like all good Catholics, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.